everyone. Welcome, everyone, to a new expert talk series. I just want to remind you that you propel citizen-powered research. The doctors are all out there doing their job, but they don't know the details that each one of you know. And so that's why we come together and we find out Dave, Steve, Doug, Anna, Lisa, Bill, Ed, Eric, Jeff, Aaron, I just want to say, and Carl, um, your son, we are all in this little caravan, and we've got to cozy up to each other, and, and that's why we meet here, is because each one of you has something that the next person in the next square could possibly use. So. We have an adventurous evening tonight because one of our awesome people, his name is Dave Schulman. Let me just tell you a little bit about Dave before I tell you the adventure he went on. He was diagnosed in 2003 with limb onset ALS. Dave has quickly plugged into the ALS landscape and uses his strategic and commercial experience to push for faster, more efficient progress towards a better outcome for all ALS families. Dave has no medical training whatsoever, but has picked up a few things as an ALS research ambassador, ALS international patient fellow, and person living with ALS. He lives in Summit, New Jersey with his wife, two children, and a new puppy. And I just want to make one little thing about that puppy. Folks, the four-leggeds in your life kind of know you better than maybe you even know yourself. So anytime that little cat or dog wants to jump on your lap, welcome them in. It's a great vibration. So with this, Dave is going to give us a presentation on the 34th Annual Symposium on ALS and MD, MND from, Dave went traveling from Basel, Basel, Switzerland. So Dave, I wanna give you the floor. You can share Thank your you, me. I appreciate it, very kind intro. Um, and apologies, my voice is probably a little medium today. I'll do the best I can. Uh, but I think I can push through it. And good thing I got a bunch of fellows here with me in case they need, I need help filling in some of the blanks. So let me just pull this up for a share. And let me move all of you guys so you're not seeing yourself. Well, we are beautiful. See everything okay? Yep. All right, excellent. So um, again, David Schulman. Um, and, you know, I had uh, a tremendous experience last month with uh, several other, other individuals traveling to Basel and being in the presence of the latest research in ALS, um, some of the brightest minds from around the world. And it left me personally with great feelings of hope and excitement. And I wanted to try to bottle up some of that and bring that here. So that way others can understand what is the latest, what are the buzzwords you're gonna hear, who are the researchers you're gonna be hearing about, and also tell you a little bit more about these great programs because to the degree you wanna get involved, there are lots of ways to get involved across the ALS landscape. And I think it's up to each of us to figure out how best to plug in and contribute. So with that, um, uh, a funny thing happened on the way to the symposium. So I, I see uh, David smiling because he heard this story. But basically, if if you see the picture here, when you're on a, a red eye, effectively going over to Europe, the seat in front of you is invariably all the way back. So if you have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the flight, you've got to basically limbo over the fixed armrest, but under the chair and 
I'm arm onset. So literally I was going, you know, trying to get into the aisle to go to the bathroom and my arm just kind of gave out and I fell into the aisle, but something caught me. And it turns out somehow by some divine intervention, my, uh, the armrest slipped into my pocket of my elastic pants and I was hanging by my pants in the aisle until some nice lady kind of kindly helped coach me off of out of that kind of crazy situation. So um, I learned a, a valuable lesson that day, which is don't attempt to take really long flights by yourself, no matter how you're feeling on the day you book it. If you've got this disease, always take a friend, caregiver, partner, whoever with you. So that was kind of takeaway number one for me. But we're all laughing about it now. I was even laughing about it five minutes later. One of those kind of funny things that at the end of the day, I, you know, will always remember, <laughs> as will the lady across from me who had to see my underwear. Um, so a little bit of background. The um, ALS MND Symposium is the biggest annual conference dedicated to ALS. I forget the final count, but there's over a thousand people uh, there from uh, over, I think I heard 40 countries from around the world. And the last one was in Perth, Australia, and that was pre-pandemic. So this was the first post-pandemic uh, in-person conference um, that everyone returned to. So there was a lot of excitement about that. It was in Basel, Switzerland from December 6th through 8th. And we'll talk next year is going to be in Montreal, so a little bit closer for those who um fellows who are and others who are traveling um but in general um it was a, quite the large and, and epic event um and then within that there's a patient fellows program that was started uh, a number of years ago and i see kathy on the line here who uh, was instrumental in starting and running that program um and really what it's intended to do is bring als patients into the scientific discourse um, make sure we are there when they're talking about us collectively. Um, the uh, program covers the cost of registration um, and some degree of the travel expenses. And there were, I think, 20 fellows accepted in 2023, um, split almost evenly between in-person and virtual. And just to give you a sense of, um, you know, what we collectively looked like, here we are. Um, it was a wonderful mix of people, um, a lot of fun. And one of the uh, exciting things that um, they did to help us get noticed is um, every patient fellow was equipped with this beautiful bright red scarf. So in a sea of a thousand people, you stand out. And it honestly sparked many interesting conversations because it was announced early on in the conference um, exactly you know what 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 the program represented and what the scarf represented and it really kind of teed us up to go there and be truly present um now if you thought this would be a quiet group of als patients and caregivers i would uh think uh, otherwise um just uh, i'll play you one quick video and just tell you exactly how we were at this conference That's right. We had wheelchair races on the brakes in between the actual sessions. So this was by no means a quiet group. And we were definitely there at the conference doing our thing, getting noticed. So big shout out to all the participants of the wheelchair races, which was a lot of fun to watch. Um, so getting into the symposium highlights, um, some of this will get a little bit scientific and I'm sure I won't do it justice. So I put a giant disclaimer on this, which is, this is my, as a patient and non-medical person, simplified summation of what I heard and saw at the symposium. And conclusions should only be drawn by published research by knowledgeable scientists. So I'll, I'll, I think that's, um, we'll go through some stuff, but I, I, I would just encourage people if they're interested in these topics 
let's go hunt down the actual published research and look into it. Um, let's not rely on information we kind of see here. Um, so I have about five of these um, just kind of pages and these are my takeaways. And in the Q&A or as we talk a little bit more, happy for other patient fellows to chime in with what, um, if, I, if I miss anything major, but um, we heard about something called CHIMP7. And uh, Dr. Alyssa Coyne who, uh, out of Johns Hopkins received the IPG award for groundbreaking research and presented it at the opening session to the full kind of symposium audience. And she's been doing research for years. So I've seen previous presentations on what's called the nuclear pore complex, which plays an important roles on, on, on how cells function and is critical to cell survival. And this is not just a, a, a driver of ALS, but also of FTD, Huntington's, Alzheimer's. This, this is a pretty big, broad uh, pathology. And it, act, it actually is responsible or plays a role in TDP43 pathology, which is um, the subject of, you know, regimens F and G on Healy and some other lots of research and lots of therapies that are in the pipeline. Um, what was really interesting is they actually found that uh, the CHIMP7 protein um, is basically is arises um, when uh, there's kind of issues in that nuclear pore complex. And you could use that to kind of help time or gauge when an ASO therapy actually works so that it doesn't try to turn toxic. Um, and so that's pretty exciting because that's a very identifiable target that they found an ASO for. And the nice thing about ASOs is the drug development time for an ASO is tends to be, a, I, I, as I understand it, like two to three years at, at its best or versus small molecules or traditional drugs tend to be like 10 years. So we could actually see this particular something on this front within the next year or so, um, two to two years. So 25, 26, which uh, is amazing. Um, so uh, this was really interesting. I would say for the Everything ALS team, this would be an awesome uh, future expert talk if you get Dr. Coin here, because that, that was a really uh, interesting one to watch. Um, this was an interesting one too. So the IGFBP7 gene, um, was found by a St. Jude scientist to be linked to ALS reversals. So I don't know if uh, McFinn was in that study or not, but they looked at 22 valid, bedlock validated ALS reversal cases and matched them to non-reversal cases and looked for, are there any gene, like, differences in genes and expression and whatnot? And they actually found that uh, this one gene that was expressed differently. And that could actually create an exciting possibility for a therapy. We always talk about if we need to suppress a gene because it's harmful, but in this case, maybe there is a way of expressing genes so they have a positive or protective outcome. So I thought this was a fascinating one as well. Oops. Um, there was a whole day of collaborative sessions on ALS and frontal temporal dementia. Um, and that was exciting to see because the more that I'm reading and learning, the more I'm seeing there are lots of similarities and overlap with other neurological diseases and opportunities to look at diagnostics and, um, and, and, and biomarkers and therapies across those. So I actually sat through those sessions. Um, it was, you know, we as we got through it, they talked about these two diseases actually being along one spectrum, because as we all know, ALS can sometimes come with cognitive um, and behavioral um, issues, at, you know, in different in different variations, um, and 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 ultimately, there's a huge opportunity for these two fields to partner going forward. And they haven't always partnered or worked that closely together historically. So this is a massive opportunity for, um, for synergy really across the two. Um, 
And there's actually really uh, interesting work happening um, in a group led by Michael Benatar that's looking to provide medical support for uh, at-risk individuals from families of genetic ALS and FTD patients. So the dialogue, as, as more genes, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, as more genes are being identified that are linked to ALS, um, you know, finding, you know, it becomes more um, uh, opportune to try to be able to find therapies and, and ways of catching it earlier and treating it earlier. Um, so they had a whole session on clinical trial results, and most of these were actually um, released or read out well ahead of the conference. Um, what was fascinating to see, and what I don't think we always grasp as ALS patients, is the amount of discussion and analysis that happens after a trial concludes. So it was fascinating to hear all of the top you know, experts around the world trying to understand and debate and figure out what went well, what didn't, what went wrong. Could the results have, you know, point, are, are the results pointing to something that we can learn from and how could that inform the next generation of treatments? So when, when it's not like at the end of a clinical trial, if it doesn't work, they just throw it all out. It actually gets used and discussed and it actually turns into a, a positive and a learning um, experience regardless. Um, it was fascinating to see um, the Tofersen uh, talk that was done, um, where it was done based on the two-year results. And we've all heard about, I think, Tofersen for SOD1 and um, some of the uh, great results it's had. Um, so it was, it was good to hear that discussed. Um, there was a um, clinical trial readout for uh, Orphan AI, Orf AI AIT 101. Um, which was a C9 ORF72 therapy that actually met its primary and secondary endpoints and will likely go into an, the next round of trials. Um, and then there were a few that you'll see below that I won't go into that did not really meet their endpoints. But, you know, there was discussion around, well, could it work for some groups and not other groups? And how do we look at the data differently? And I thought that was really interesting. And then, um, you know, I unfortunately had to fly home and missed the closing session, but I watched it on video replay and I'm kicking myself that I didn't take a later flight because it was really a, amazing. So um, the Healy Prize for Innovation in ALS was actually given to a group of five doctors and a team from Biogen for uh, establishing neurofilament biomarkers as an early diagnostic and prognostic biomarker for ALS. And that's super important because many trials historically have depended on survey results from ALS, F FRS, um, R, um, which tells you how patients are doing. But a lot of times there's no leading indicator for that and you may not see things manifest soon enough. So having additional biomarkers um, are really, really helpful and there's been great work happening there. So it was nice to see that recognized. Um, there was the... Lodging and Family ALS and Down Award for uh, Innovative Healing, which was awarded to five doctors who developed a therapy for stopping and reversing FUS ALS, which was an aggressive form of the disease impacting juvenile. So um, there was actually a young woman there who I think high, high school age, who was actually on stage with, with breathing apparatus and whatnot, but very much alive and there and focused and in, you know, several years into a disease that honestly, before that therapy came about, um, you know, would have taken her life in under two years. Um, and I think what that showed is not only, even though, you know, other types of ALS may be very, very different, it's showing that as you actually can treat the underlying causes of ALS, the body has a great ability to regenerate. And I think that's an important learning from across Tofersen and from this FUS ALS um, gene therapy that we have a that we have a lot to hope for because that could that there there's there's a way out of this at some point. Um, Dr. Matthew Harms from Columbia discussed progress in um, really around just genetic like genetics and how do we identify more genes. 
how do we promote genetic testing um, and how do we actually use all this data in a way to advance the science. Um, there was a, a model that um, a doctor from uh, UMC Utrecht dis uh, basically that can use certain biometrics to pre predict survival uh, time, which I thought was fascinating too. I'd be scared to actually use it, but um, it's still interesting and good to know that, you know, they're, that, that they're understanding how these mechanisms impact survival. Um, there was a late breaking clinical trial update from a doctor out of Cedar sinai who um, actually uh, in, in four patients did um, stem cell transplants directly into the motor, uh, motor cortex. So right into the brain through a craniotomy. Um, and, you know, they talked about that work, how it went and the work that's gone going and more to come there. But it's, um, that was of course interesting because one of the concerns with many of the drugs and, and therapies being developed is it gonna actually get to the brain. Um, in that case, when you put it directly into the brain, you know, it's getting there. So, um, so that was interesting to hear that that's how they aim to solve it. Um, and then uh, the other one, which I thought was probably the most interesting was a gene therapy for sporadic ALS that uh, effectively um, discussed and described how TDP43 loss, which is in you know, the vast majority of, of ALS cases induces uh, cryptic exons. Um, and you could actually use those exons to time when the gene therapy turns on or off so it can heal things when things are not going well and then turn off before it becomes toxic to the healthy cells. And I thought that's, so And when you hear about gene therapy, you tend to think about the ALS mutate, like common genetic mutations, but gene therapy really could be for anyone with the disease um, based on what we've heard in the conference. So that was an important takeaway too. Um, and that's, those were kind of my big takeaways. I don't know how we're doing on time, McFinn, but I'd love we're to, fine. are we okay? Cause I was oh, going to yeah. say, if David or Lisa, if you want to like chime in, anything I missed that you, you kind of took home or Kathy? Hey, Dave, there's a, a question in the chat that I'll go ahead and, and try to address a little bit about whether the video replay of the conference is available. For people who are registered for the symposium, they do have the recordings available for them for a limited period of time. Unfortunately, it's not available for everybody. So, um, but there is, I'll put it in the chat. There's a website where there's a lot of material and a lot of recaps of sessions, et cetera, that you might find helpful. And also there's information about the poster sessions, which are, there were a substantial number of posters that were interesting too. So I'll put that link in the chat. Yeah. Um, I saw the news about the ADORE trial around uh, at Averone, Radakava basically. Um, you know, it's approved here in the States, but not in Europe. So uh, there was a lot of discussion around the fact that we in the U.S. we have the three R's, and most in other parts of the world there's the one R, right? So there's a lot of additional work happening to try to evaluate um, whether or not those drugs are truly have efficacy. And I, I know we're all watching them very closely. So I, uh, uh, David Busek here. So I've got a few things to say. First is that Dave, I'm really impressed with how much you were able to take from this and the work you put into the presentation with obviously a lot of, of additional background checks and verification. So um, it was such an, an incredibly overwhelming amount of information that came at us over that period of time. So thank you for, for summarizing it really nicely. Um, I'm, I'm very sorry that you missed the last session, especially the one with the FUS patient um, it was very emotional to hear the um, the progress that this, I think she was 19 at the time, but she'd been three years since diagnosis in a disease form that typically is a six to nine month prognosis and generally hits uh, children and adolescents. 
So it was really powerful and emotional. Um, so I'm sorry you missed that. Yeah. Um, one, one thing also that I found as a takeaway is um, I hadn't realized how big the ice bucket challenge was 10 years ago. And several people made reference to money from the ice bucket challenge, bringing, well, funding and awareness of the disease. So that was interesting. And I also was uh, found out uh, sort of on the sidelines and conversations with people, some of those things about different drug availability in different parts of the world. And that was interesting and, and a little distressing. Um, for example, radicava in the US is, or which is the oral adaravone, is um, taken two weeks on, two weeks off. But the formulation that they're working on getting approved in Europe is going to be a daily dose. Um, so you know, why is the same chemical being used differently in different parts of the world? And why are some available in some places and not in others? So um, I'll be quiet. No, that was uh, that was interesting, too. And it kind of reminded me, too, there there's a company working on like real uh, realizol in a breath strip kind of construct where you just put it on your tongue and it dissolves. Uh, we heard about a company that's trying to come up with a pill based radic radicava dose as well. So you're not taking the, you know, solution, if you will. So there's all sorts of interesting work going on around formulations. Um, the other thing that I was just going to add that I also picked up and, and took away was that it's important for us to be present and speak up when we see things that don't make sense. And I found myself speaking up in a couple different parts of the conference. One was around that day in ALS and FTD where we got to the end of the day and the next steps just weren't clear to me. It's like, okay, you guys just spent a whole day collaborating. Who's on point? Like who's doing what next? And I got a pretty good answer for that, although not a complete answer. So it's something I hope, I know who to follow up with at least. And the last one was, um, there was a, a some very unfortunate comments being made around families of C9 ORF 72 patients, um, where, you know, comments like they're gregarious, um, tend to be more gregarious, they come from fractured families, um, I forget there were uh, cognitive and behavioral differences, abnormal, and I just like raised my hand up and I said, you cannot make statements about that, about a subset of the population based on their genealogy. It's no different than making, you know, comparisons between any kind of genetic. And honestly, if my family was participating in that research and it was used to prove that they are cognitively or have, be, you know, different or behaviorally different, that would really trouble me too. So I think it's important that we are there and I would kind of look at my two comments. One was to try to spur progress where I didn't see it happening fast enough. And the other was to kind of be a little bit of an ethical watchdog where I saw something that I didn't feel good about. And a number of people came up afterwards and said, thank you for speaking up. I was thinking the same thing, that that's just not right. So any other comments? I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in. Can you close the screen share so we get bigger images of everyone? Oh, sure. Thanks. Um, I'm sorry, not sure if I'm telling. This is Lisa. I'm also always a fellow and very good synopsis. Um, unfortunately, I also miss Friday. Uh, I had to go home sick, but that's another story. There's a lot of people there bound to happen. <laughs> but it was really, first of all, it was such an experience to meet people in person that I've met in these groups before. Um, and yes, I did attend some of the sci um, more scientific that David is uh, talking about, uh, having to do with the biomarkers and all the cascades of um, events that happen at the cellular or molecular level, but I also was drawn to some of the management um, presentations. Um, for those of you that did not attend, one thing that you may or may not realize is there were 
basically three tracks and each presenter had like 20 minutes. So it was almost like bullets of, here's what we did, here's what we found, and here's our conclusion. So um, to that effect, it was a lot of information. Yes. <laughs> and um, a lot of it was very, very, again, molecular, scientific um, outcomes, um, measurable outcomes. And a lot of it was also uh, descriptive uh, and family experiences. And what I can say is um, among us here, one, uh, several of the takeaways were some of the interventions that are available are best used sooner than later. A few examples are feeding tubes, uh, ventilatory support, um, what else? Uh, even things like uh, nutrition, uh, support, there's still, again, this was international, but in the US, uh, I'm fairly fair to say that most of us live in population, populous areas that do have clinics, and yet a lot of people do not attend their clinics, which is multidisciplinary. So whatever uh, influence you have on people um, that you know that could benefit from this information, attending their clinics is, is such an important aspect of getting the information that they need, uh, getting the care that they need, getting the connection to the support that they need, um, uh, that uh, skipping it, and many people do for either geographical reasons or I don't know why, uh, but clinics are really important. Um, other, so, and yes, I did attend some of the, the more scientific uh, as well. Um, and even real basic um, concepts such as anticholinergic. So many of us deal with uh, secretions and anticholinergics are a common way to manage that. But in the long run, they're not very helpful and the side effects are um, difficult to deal with. So small snippets of information like that may not seem like groundbreaking, but in terms of managing your disease day to day and in the long term for families and people affected, it's important. So there were a lot of um, other aspects to this conference that, um, that uh, covered a lot of valuable information to those of us dealing with this, family members, <clears throat> loved ones, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> And uh, what else I want to say about that? So there were, again, uh, I'm just expressing another aspect of all the information that was available to us. So I don't know if anyone else, who else was there of this group? Uh, yeah, Catherine. sorry to budge in, Lisa, but we have two questions. So we have one question in the chat from Diane. First question is, is there any research on Bulber ALS? It's a good question. I think there were definitely um, there was definitely dialogue on it, um, and just ALS and like a lot of it was ALS in general. And where I thought a lot of Bulbar dialogue happening was actually in the ILAD Professionals Forum, which was before the scientific conference, where they talked a lot about you know everything from you know ventilation and speech, and they had a number of kind of allied professionals like speech pathologists and and why not sharing kind of their strategies and, and research and progress and things along those lines. But I don't know if David or, or Lisa, you have anything that you would add on that? The, there was a presentation on food preparation with a, mm -hmm. an additive that uh, can be added to blended foods to um, give them a body that makes them more it was interesting because it was more palatable, but also by taking, say, a pineapple, grinding it up and mixing it with this material and then putting it in a mold that's the shape of a, of a wedge of pineapple, the researchers are saying that it actually stimulates your body to be prepared to process pineapple versus just having a bowl of pineapple mush. Um, so they had different molds that were like the shape of a chicken leg or a stack of peas or um, other kind of of foods to make them more realistic to people's 
experience. So that, um, and then yes, definitely different language interpretations, speech interpretation, message banking, message, no, message banking, voice banking, um, a lot of things in the Allied Professionals Forum. Thank you, right, everybody. Right, that was not part oh, of the- sorry. I was about to say, we have another comment as well. Lynn raised their hand. Lynn, do you still have a question or a comment to make before we continue? Lynn? Yes. I was a virtual participant to the conference here from the U.S. This is a paid conference, but the online virtual fees are really quite modest. Importantly, the conference offers scholarships to both fly people overseas and to handle their online fees. So I would encourage everybody here to look into being a part of the next conference, which will be in Canada. Thank you. Well, thanks, Lynn, for chiming in. That's a great, great point. And I know for, for me, I don't know, we're all be in a year, but I, I plan on participating to whatever degree I can because I gained so much from this one. Me too. May I answer the questions? Um, yes, there was a presentation about glycemic index. And so what this meant was that a higher glycemic index seemed to be protective. Um, so that meant like processed foods, not uh, whole grains. It was a preliminary study, a small group uh, but yeah, they they will be looking into this. Um, and also, I would like to say that in terms of Bobo ALS, I have Bobo ALS. And I did ask a few presenters if they looked at the subset of Bobo ALS. And uh, for the what I the tracks that I was attending, the answer was no. But maybe uh, David, you have a different response. Uh, on Bulbar, you said, or I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, 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 I kind of looked at the Allied Professional Forum as the one where there was probably the most value. We talked about that a little bit, um, but I thought, thank you for answering the question on the high glycemic index. Though I spent a little bit of time talking to that doctor. He's out of Columbia at both Neil's and at the um, and at the conference and. You know, one thing he was very quick to caution on is don't go out and eat a bunch of like a whole loaf of bread a day and cookies. And like, that's not his point uh, as much as I would love that for it to be his point. If I if I could eat a whole bag of M&Ms and cure my ALS, like that would be amazing. But, um, you know, it's really more around, you know, trying to kind of periodically spike your blood sugar through a roll or something like that. And he really, most of his testing was done in C9 ORF72 and not necessarily more broadly. So that's where I would caution everyone to wait for the proper research before making any changes to your diet and look at publications and talk to your doctor. Um, it's interesting developments that they're looking at things like how your diet can influence your, you know, uh, your, your prognosis and your well-being. But, um, you know, just be careful with it. It's the only thing I'd say. And I, on the high glycemic index, what I understood was that it affects the interface between the nerve endings and the muscles, and that that um, the sugars that are generated play an important role somehow in communicating the the message from the nerve ending to the muscle. So when that breaks down, your muscles aren't aren't reacting. And the high glycemic load can enhance that, if I understood it correctly. There was also some research on on quinine, and uh, some studies that showed an effect, uh, a positive effect of quinine. So the outcome from that is drink more gin and tonic. 
I just want to answer uh, Lisa's question about uh, sub sub uh, type of bulbar. Um, from thank you for um, many of you who have actually participated in our citizen driven research. From the data we've collected, there is a subtypes that is some people do change their words per minute as they decline, and some people change the way they're speaking and keep their you know pace. Um, so we are seeing subtypes, and we are trying to you know. Um, kind of work with our uh, therapeutic pharma partners about how do we implement those subtypes in the as a biomarker, uh, you know, for the assessment as well. Yes, we are seeing that, Lisa. I'm not sure I heard a whole lot of that at the symposium, though. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't think um, people are really focused on it. And that's that's one of the issues with this disease is there's so much heterogeneity that a certain subset may be helped by um, research or product or whatever pharma. You know, it is part of the, the yeah. Might be things. might be people are doing it like we are doing the work. We just didn't speak there, so I guess it wasn't the focus in the MND conference. But there is work going on, absolutely. Hi, there's a question from Elizabeth in the chat. And the question is, I'm trying to find the question. Sorry about that. Question is, are there any, is there inf any information or research on new biomarkers? Um, so there were definitely whole work streams around biomarkers. A lot, a lot, a lot of discussion around neurofilament. Um, I feel like that kind of took front and center. There were others, I'd have to go back to, to others um, that I saw, um, and I don't know them offhand or can't recall offhand, um, but I, I know that, like I said, there was a whole award and set of conversations around neurofilament and excitement that they're, that, you know, it's, it's being, you know, pretty well adopted at this point. I, I'm just looking at the program and one of the sessions was on tissue biomarkers. I didn't attend it, so I don't have any information, but um, but it was definitely a topic beyond NFL, although certainly a lot of NFL. I mean, good point, uh, Kathy, in the chat around digital biomarkers, um, you know, the and I think that's one thing that everything ALS is testing via the Radcliffe study is the ability to monitor patients well remotely. Um, you know, I was kind of questioning my breathing this morning and I kind of just opened up <laughs> my spirometer and it allowed me to see at home without having to go to a clinic. And thank you, Casey, for telling me how to do that. Um, so, you know, it's, there's benefit that we have as patients adopting some of these digital tools and, um, and what's great is, um, and I'm a participant in Radcliffe, um, I, you know, I was able to send information to my doctor when I started to notice decline in my speech and, you know, there's real benefits to this. And I think we're collectively onto something, um, looking at citizen driven research and, and whatnot. And I will kind of use this opportunity since you've given me a platform kindly, just to say that we all as ALS patients and families, you know, can't expect to be carried over the mountain by the ALS kind of community. We have to actually get out and push and that may mean different things to different people. Um, that could mean participating in research and clinical trials, that could mean fundraising, that could mean um, donating your brain to science, that could that can mean um, simply being a, a positive force in meetings like this um, or, or attending conferences like I have and really bringing a patient voice into the dialogue. So I would just encourage everyone to whatever degree you feel um, compelled to do so, um, do something, help contribute to the cure and the outcome here. They, they can't do this without us. At the very least, uh, join the registry. So TDI has a registry, the CDC has a registry, and at least we can track the natural course of the disease, which if we have enough of this data, and data sharing is a big thing as well, because 
previously research was done in silos, data was not shared. Um, but sharing data in this uh, in the registries uh, helps track the natural normal course of the disease. So in a way, it helps decrease the um, the uh, placebo or uh, clinical groups that are not treated, non-treatment groups, because we have much more broad idea of what would happen without a particular intervention. So I would promote that as well. Thanks, Lisa. Brian, any other questions in the chat or any other questions from uh, the broad group here? Yeah, we have a question right now. So we have a question from, excuse me if I mispronounce your name, Tanzel or Tenzel. The question is, let's see. Uh, is there any new information on the AKV9 study, the drug Ozdenler dash, dash Silverman is currently working on? I don't remember hearing anything about that at the conference. Yeah. I, I just put the link on the um, chat there. She came and spoke. Uh, both of them came and spoke at, in our community, I think, about a few months ago. So um, I don't think there is more update, but this was about eight months ago. And we can actually invite them again in, you know, to come in and give an update from uh, last time they spoke. We'll do that. Any other questions, folks? Any comments? Dave, you put on a beautiful presentation full of information. Uh, you traveled far to get to that information and you made yourself available tonight. And what that tells me is you are harnessing the power of citizens research. And folks, we all need to follow in Dave's steps as much as we can. Some of us can do more, some of us can do less, but if everybody does a little, then we've got a lot. And McFinn, can I add one? I, I didn't speak quickly enough. Um, I just want to draw attention for anybody who's not following the chat. Kathy's comment about the patient fellows program being, um, if I may read it, is and independently run from the symposium. It depends on donations and volunteers to bring people to the scientific discussions, both remotely and in person. Um, and she says some nice stuff about the, the group of patient fellows and has a link. So um, I really believe this is a great a program to continue and um, anybody who can help with that certainly is appreciated. And Kathy has made this a mission for the last dozen years or so. So thank you very much, Kathy. Yes, thank you, Kathy. We want to say thank you to each and every one of you too, just for showing up tonight, because in numbers, you never know who's got a little answer that could help somebody in the next window. Folks, we've got a very special evening tonight. We're going to have a panel discussion. We have four of our ALS heroes who have been in the fight for quite a while. And they have come forward to offer some insights from their journey. I wanna introduce Dave Schulman once again, and Janie Gobelli and Michael Thayer. And uh, folks, could you like uh, raise your hand so I can keep you all up front? I mean, on the, on the reaction down below. Um, Janie, it's down there where, where the reactions are, um, and Michael, there you got it, there you got it, and one for Janie up there, and if it doesn't come up, Janie, it's okay. Raise so, hand. <laughs> yeah, there you got it, okay. We have our panel up front, folks. These are the people who have gone through a lot, and once you do that, um, you come up with positive steps. Sometimes they're very hard to get, but tonight's panel discussion is about positive steps you took after your diagnosis. Examples, diet, 
ALS education, supplements, mindfulness, health. Michael Thayer, um, I, I want to just say a word about you, Michael. Uh, Michael was born uh, in um, Bro Brokedon, Massachusetts, if I get that right, Michael. Right. And, yes. Oh, thank you. And is uh, 66 years old. He was a singer, an actor, insurance salesman, tile business owner, and also the husband of Pamela for 40 years, residing now in Antiboro, Massachusetts. My ALS journey began in August 20, uh, 21, involving the left finger weakness when playing my guitar. So folks, it all starts somewhere. Janie, Janie Gobelli serves as an advisory committee member for the Healy ALS platform trial and the, I'll say, Corellis. And then mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Janie a little bit later to tell us what CISCRP, Global Patient Advisory Board. Wow. And an ALS Research Ambassador for the Northeast ALS Consortium, Niels. And a reviewer for the Les Turner ALS Foundation's Educational Materials and Programs. She was diagnosed with ALS in 2021 a farmer elementary teacher and licensed cosmetologist. She is proud to work as an ALS educator, advisor, and speaker because it allows her to be a voice for all ALS warriors and follow her lifelong passion for learning and educating others. Janie, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, Janie, actually, I'd like to start with you this evening. Can okay. you give us those uh, positive steps that you took when you got your diagnosis? Absolutely. Um, first one, you know, was like educating uh, myself. Uh, I kind of threw myself into as much as I could learn about ALS. And uh, literally like every day I'd be like on webinars and listening and just educating myself. And um, when the opportunity came, because I uh, live in the Chicago land area, the suburbs, and um, I belong to Les Turner, uh, ALS Foundation, and they sent me, a, you know, email. So they were looking for um, ALS research ambassadors. And I was like, oh, this is right up my alley. This is something I really, really want to do. And um, it just kind of took off from there. I'm also a part of a clinical trial. Um, and so I have experience with that as well, where um, with one of the Healy um platforms, I was not, um, excuse me, was not uh, qualified for that. So I knew how that went. Um, I had a um, lumbar puncture that didn't go too well. They couldn't get any, you know, fluids out. So I had experienced that. Um, and then I just felt like I wanted to sit on advisory boards so that I could um, be the voice for other ALS patients where uh, I sit with pharmaceutical companies and they want to know, well, what would be a reasonable time frame, you know, for this clinical trial? Um, how many visits, you know, do you think is, uh, you know, um, quality and availability for the patient? So I would definitely like, you know, listen to my fellow ALS warriors and bring that back to the uh, different pharmaceutical boards. And um, then, you know, we meet quite often. I'm with several different um besides Healy, uh, other different pharmaceutical companies. And they really appreciate um, knowing, you know, what we want, you know, and what is reasonable for us. Uh, for instance, you know, if they're talking like a two-year clinical trial study, we're like, we don't have that time, you know, six months to maybe nine months or, you know, up to a year. Uh, we talk about, you um, just quality of life, what, that, what does that look like for an ALS patient? Um, and they really listen and they, they take um, everything back to, you know, the head pharmaceutical companies and definitely um, apply that. Uh, and so I've been where it's like preclinical and now they're pretty much on the horizon to be starting. Um, I was on the Congressional Directed Medical Research Program um, where 
I listened to preclinical um, looking for grants and things. And we sat and we discussed what we felt, you know, was beneficial and we felt it was promising. Uh, was it going to um, help a majority of ALS patients or was it too narrow of a, a study? So as part of that, um, you know, I just, I feel like there is so much going on out there and it's, it's phenomenal that, you know, there's so many pharmaceutical companies that are working day and night for us and they're unresolved. They want to be the first person, obviously, to try to cure it, stop it, you know, reverse it. Uh, so they have our, you know, best interest in mind. And um, I guess that's about as much as I can say about that. Do you have other, you know, questions? Well, I wanted to know what you're doing right now, because see, I know that you installed an elevator in your backyard. Yes. Now, what's that about? <laughs> so um, the home I currently live in uh, is like a raised ranch and uh, there's a very high stoop when you first come in, lots of narrow stairs. Uh, we could not, our upper level is where our living space is. And um, they could not do like a chair lift or, you know, to go up the stairs, stair lift. So the only way that they could make it work was to put a lift outside of my home. And now my, our deck is very high, you know, because you're going from the bottom level up to the second level. And so the way we uh, researched it was to put a lift in. And um, the lift costed about Thirteen to fourteen thousand dollars, and uh, Les Turner uh, was really great about giving us a, a grant, not for the whole amount, but you know it helps with you know the bills, obviously. Uh, and uh, you know it's it's hard, you know, because things are very expensive. And I'm like, well, how do I get in my home and leave my home unless I had this this device? So um, it is a godsend, but however. When it breaks down, it's not fun. So for instance, it's very touchy. So if anything is underneath the lift, it will not work. Um, they take very good care of me, the company, because they're like, oh no, she's you know stuck in the garage and it's cold out. We need to get you out, you know, get service out right away. And um, you know, they they really want to make sure that they stand behind their product. Uh, so it's, we have one of the dogs that actually likes to go up and down with me on my, uh, wheelchair <laughs> and it's like, move out of the way because I don't want to roll over him, but, uh, he loves to roll, you know, go up and down on it. But, um, that is my, you know, my only way I can leave the home is up and down on this lift. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Janie? I don't want to uh, go to the other panelists because I want to have Janie's conversation fresh in your mind. Anyone have a question for Janie? Oh, my Janie, I have a quick question. What do you do for mind mindfulness? Mindfulness. So I do a lot of um, meditation and I do listen to uh, as I go to sleep every night, it's called uh, prognosis hypnosis or something like progressive hypnosis. And it's about uh, listening and it's like affirmations about your body healing and your, um, you know, your cells and, you know, envisioning, you know, I'm walking again. How does that feel? That type of thing. Um, I do a lot of that. Uh, I'm very faithful. I have, you know, strong faith in God. Um, and I, you know, literally, you know, pray and I pray for others before I pray for myself. And I feel that's very important. Um, I always, you know, put myself at the end of the, you know, my prayer list, uh, because I feel people have it worse off than I have. Yes. My days are not easy and, you know, ALS is very difficult. And, um, but again, like I, I look out and people may have, you know, more difficulties going on in their life. Um, my whole hope is to give people hope. And um, I just have a really positive outlook um, in that I'm gratitude, you know, I have gratitude. So each day I'm here, I'm very appreciative for the days that I do have. Um, and I think that that helps a lot as well with 
the mindfulness is, you know, looking at the sun, you know, it's a sunny day or it's raining. Oh my gosh, this is great. It's raining so that, you know, uh, the flowers can bloom in the spring and things like that. Thank you. Thank you, Janie. That's, uh, you know, there's nothing like personal experience. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. So David, let's go over to you. What are the positive steps that you took after your diagnosis? Um, you know, there's a lot of examples of diet, education, supplements, mindfulness, health. Any of those on your list? I mean, I I just effectively poured myself into research. And I think you you and the everything ALS team know the way I kind of came to this organization is as I was trying to learn and research, I basically trolled through your past two years of expert talks. And um, by no means am I an expert, but I certainly was able to ask very informed um, questions of my care of my care team very, very early on and start kind of understanding and managing. And honestly, for me, given my personality, trying to learn more was my part of a way of coping. But it led me down some very interesting roads. So like Janie, I, I attended the um, CRLI, Clinical Research Learning Institute at this year's NEILS conference, and I've been plugging into um, the Yealy Platform Trial Patient Advisory Group. I'm part of the ALS Focus um, Survey kind of group. Uh, thank you, Don Baxter, if you're on here still, uh, for referring me over there, um, and a number of other conversations and efforts that are kind of too many to mention, but um, <coughs> I think honestly, this has been a bit of a therapy for me in that, you know, I'm part, part I'm learning, it, it's kind of a dual benefit. I'm learning and I'm operating at the cutting edge of the research, so to speak, but then I'm also giving back and contributing alongside it. And that's mm -hmm. greatly fulfilling. Um, I would say the other thing too, is ALS is like a giant everyday challenge that you can treat as a disability or you can treat it as a puzzle. So I'm always excited when I figure out a new hack as to like, you know, my latest being a right angle steak knife. So I could still kind of cut my steak at a restaurant um, and enjoy it rather than have the restaurant or my wife do it for me. Um, and there's lots of little hacks like that. And it works for some things and not for others, but there's subtle satisfaction I get for outsmarting this disease. I still think ALS is not a disease you fight. It's a disease you hack. It's like, it's a disease you um, navigate, right? Um, so that's how I, I guess I've been thinking about it. McFinn also mentioned our puppy, our little uh, Shih Tzu Duffy, who's been a wonderful little uh, therapy dog. He pees all over the place, but he is adorable. <laughs> so, really. um, and he's been great for the whole family too. <clears throat> That's... Can I add to that? I agree with uh, David that, you know, it gives you a purpose um, because I felt like once I had to leave my teaching career and my uh, cosmetology career, I, I kind of lost myself because all it was was like, oh, you know, I'm ALS and, you know, I'm, you know, what do I do with myself? And, you know, doing all this activities and, you know, being um, proactive, I guess is the word has given me uh, definitely, a, you know, a purpose so that I can speak for others and um, hopefully, you know, soon we can beat this disease. Thank you, Jamie. And one more thing to add, McFinn, which is, you know, this, the one thing I realized in digging into the ALS landscape and researching is, there's a lot of amazing heroes in all corners, whether it's research or clinicians or philanthropies, but they're not always working together or talking as much as they should be. Um, and progress isn't always as fast as it could be. And there's lots of inefficiencies out there. And I think that that's an important angle of advocacy for the future is figuring out how do we optimize all the work, all the funding, how the landscape is working so that everything is working better together. Um, I think that's a massive opportunity and it's something that we collectively as a, you know, if we can articulate it and think, you know, come together around it, 
we could probably spark progress faster. We agree completely. Thank you for, you know, you need to voice those things because people need to hear that they're needed and that they're important and that they make a difference. And folks, harnessing the power of citizen research is our occupation because each one of us is, I know you're a researcher. I know you are. I know you're looking for these answers. I know you're spending your precious moments thinking, how can I improve my life? And with ALS, and how can I share what I found with someone else? That is, that's what an extended ALS family does for each other. And we're all pretty close. We've been together for, folks, it's been four years. Okay, what's today? Oh my gosh, today's the day. Oh. Folks, we've been together for four years today. Yeah. So, wow. What an experience. Today, we had our first meeting. Mike Finn, myself, and some volunteers to say, what should we do? I think that's when we selected the name Everything ALS four years wow. ago today. Folks, you're making the four years really worthwhile. See, just seeing your faces here make us feel, I mean, we, we've dedicated our lives to this because we're part of it. We know. We, we have personal, we have been personally touched. And that makes all the difference. So, okay, I'm going to jump over to Michael Thayer because Michael, to me, has inspired me so many times with his smile. He's <laughs> always like, hey, McFinn. You know, he wrote me back the other day. He said, hey, McFinn, after I watched the show, I got so inspired. I went and did a tile job that these broken tiles for years were in my house. And I got so excited about the power that I still have. I went and took all those tiles out and put brand one new ones in yeah. and everything's perfect. Now I don't ever look at those again. So well, I'm, I'm proud of you, McFinn. It's all about fear and you just took away the fear. Okay, buddy, give us a little bit about what you're doing for um, your positive steps. Wow. Well, thank you, McFinn, for even inviting me because I've only been on the Everything ALS for about a year, but uh, I really, I give up my choir night because I've been singing every Wednesday uh, night at choir for about 35 years. And uh, I sent a text message to my choir director this tonight to say, I'm sorry, I got to do this thing on Everything ALS, so I can't be there tonight, but in any case, I so um, am looking forward to giving people information because I think once we all know that we do obtain a diagnosis such as this, you say, what do I do now? What can I do to help myself? Because the doctor has so many clients and uh, they don't have the time to email back right away. So you have to do a lot of research. So I applaud David, his uh, intuitiveness to go after the information. And it's inspired me because uh, I try to do a lot of things based on what I've seen on ALS News, uh, different programs like Rune. I would recommend anybody get on ron.com, Rune. It has so much great information by caregivers, uh, doctors, uh, speech pathologists, physical therapists, you can get any information about your condition and even have people email you back information about what you what you need. And it's it's so useful because it's all about having details that can address your condition. And I've looked a lot of things first. I'd like to talk about diet. Uh, my wife and I, we have a kind of a Mediterranean uh, diet style. Uh, I don't eat red meat. I haven't had any red meat in uh probably 25 years, uh, but I will have chicken every now and again, and I'll have some, you know, protein. I try to get about 30 or so percent of my meal protein, uh, and then I try to do about 40 to 50 percent carbohydrates just to keep my weight up because I've read a lot of things about not losing weight when you have ALS because it can progress quite a bit, and so uh, I, I don't drink any soda uh, I don't drink sugar drinks. I really drink alkaline water. I, and the only reason why I drink alkaline water is I read it on an 
ALS News program that they said that's the kind of water that you should be taking. So uh, I do that all the time. Uh, I don't, you know, I have a lot of fruit, but I don't do grapefruit because it coincides with a kind of a contraindication with a lot of the medications such as the Relivrio and the Radicava. Uh, it really, you're not supposed to mix those two. And so, uh, you know, the some of the things I do for uh, diet, I, I would call this in diet, I take a nap every day, usually about two o'clock to three o'clock because I have found, even though I was 20 years as a tile installer doing bathrooms and doing everything in a, in a house, uh, you know, I get exhausted, you know, because I, I'm trying to lug myself around. I'm still ambulatory. Uh, I was able to uh, get some AFOs recently, which are, uh, you know, adaptive foot orthotics, which helps my feet. I have a, a bad foot drop. So it, it just keeps my feet up and I can walk normally, but uh, uh, it, it, it helps in uh, my daily routine. Uh, but the thing about education that I would really uh, stress is if, you're, if you have access to a computer or if you don't, you can go to the library and many times the library uh, has resources to uh, obtain information about ALS. Uh, go on everything ALS, go on Rune. Uh, I try to do the Healy platform trial every Thursday. Uh, Dr. Merritt Kudowitz, she's on that along with uh, Sabrina Pag Paganoni. And uh, they talk about everything that's happening at the Healy Center, which uh, is really is extraordinary what they're doing. Uh, supplements. Uh, you had asked me, uh, McFinn, what am I doing for supplements? I've read in many of the Everything ALS uh, or, or Dr. Bedlack's uh, ALS reversals, you read a lot of the stories of the people who have had reversals and they were doing many supplements. Well, I, 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 I think everybody knows their body and what they can absorb and what they can, you know, can absorb. Uh, but I, I basically just rely on a couple of things and I don't mind telling you what I take. I uh, really rely on milk thistle. Uh, milk thistle is a really good liver cleanser. And uh, many years ago, I had a cancer diagnosis back in 1990. And I found this out at a hospital in Rhode Island that a doctor says, you know, if you're going to need any chemo, take this milk thistle because it will help your liver get cl cleansed out. And so uh, I do four grams. I do 4,000 milligrams a day of milk thistle because of the really is all. Because it really is all for me makes my liver enzymes elevate. Uh, I do for uh, other things. I take B12 uh, for just uh, just good energy life. I do B6 and I do B3. I just started B3 because I've heard from a uh, ALS News uh, article that I read that it gives neuro. It's a neuroprotector uh, and one of the things that uh, I found out that the uh, the neuroprotector is so important in just trying to see if you can get some sort of repair uh, because there's so many things you can do and it's the, the, the neurons that die that uh, you're really trying to uh, hopefully recover from. Um, that's what I do for that. For mindfulness, uh, I listen to classical music all the time when I'm doing things around the house. It seems to calm me down. Uh, when I wrote this little uh, outline for, for tonight, uh, I had classical music going and it just, it really calms me. I don't listen to uh, too much rock or anything like that. I, uh, I've had a music career all my life, but uh, that's the kind of music that I like to do for what I'm dealing with now. Uh, now for uh, trials, I know one of the questions was uh, that you asked me is, uh, what are you doing to cope with your challenges? Trials. I just finished last week the 24-week uh, Platform F Calico trial, and so I now have the regular drug. Uh, I was on ex I was able to be given expanded access, and I've been taking the regular drug, and I haven't had any problems whatsoever. 
uh, with any side effects uh, with the, the calico drug. And uh, that's a drug that supposedly is supposed to help go into the spinal column and into the brain. It, it'll, it'll pass the, the blood brain barrier. And so uh, I'm hoping that it, it works. And, uh, you know, uh, Janie, when we were, or Janie, when we were talking about mindfulness, I was talking about what I do. Every time I take my medications, I say, heal me. Just, I say it out loud. I, I let my wife hear it. I don't care. I'm just trying to make an affirmation. Heal me. This is what I'm taking it for. And, you know, I, I seem to be uh, tr just trying to keep that attitude because uh, you can really go out of your mind with uh, loneliness about the disease because it's, you know, it's all consuming sometimes. But uh, my wife and I have done a thing on Wednesdays. Every Wednesday we go out and we look around and we go to the mall or we do something and we maybe have a lunch out just so we have some time together doing something other than what I'm doing during the day, which is looking up ALS stories and things like that. Uh, but uh, that's what we're doing now. Now, as far as equipment, uh, what I'm doing for equipment, uh, see right now my hands are, are really not functioning quite well. I wear splints, I wear finger splints at night. If I can show them to you in the, uh, with the video, it's, it's something that I put over each finger when I, before I go to sleep and it keeps my fingers straight. And so, you know, it, it, it aids at least in me thinking that I'm gonna do something to prevent my hands from just buckling up. Uh, but I still uh, can walk fairly well. And if you, you wanna see what an AFO looks like, uh, I was able to get these about uh, maybe 45 days ago. And uh, it's an AFO that I put in my shoe and it just keeps my feet from, from you know, dropping. It keeps my foot up and I have a, a little bit of a insert that I put on top of the shoe it's a uh, it's a, a formed piece that fits inside your shoe. So you take the guts out of a sneaker and just put your foot on it. And uh, I was uh, you know I attach the uh, the actual piece to the top of my leg, and uh, it help you know helps me uh, you know walk anywhere. And not long ago, back in late November, my wife and I uh, had an opportunity to take the family and our extended family to Disney World down to Florida. And we were gone for seven days and I was going to possibly take a wheelchair that was given to me by the uh, compassionate care people from the Cape. And uh, I really wanted to, you know, I, I really didn't want to put my family out and I thought it would be a, a real burden for everybody. Uh, so I used my AFOs and I basically walked the park. Uh, mm -hmm. I did about 26 and a half miles oh. in the seven days that awesome. we were there. And uh, I was tired, but uh, I still was able to do it. And uh, I was able to take breaks and uh, deal with the, all the conditioning that you need to do to, to do a week of Disney because uh, it was an amazing week. We had the best time we ever had. And uh, we've been going for a long time, but uh, this week was great. This time we went, we had the grandkids and we just had a blast. And uh, I, one thing I didn't mention is one of the things I do, and for the people who have the bulbar uh, beginning, I use a breathing apparatus. Uh, other than singing, I, I sing probably about an hour to an hour and a half doing vocalizing and, and singing uh, each day but I do breathing exercises and, and I don't mind showing you this product. It's basically a little, uh, let me see, my hands don't work so well. So uh, it basically has these little balls and these little tubes and I blow into the tube. And it basically, you, you, it has, it gives you intake and it gives you exhaling. So it's a, just a product to help your breathing. And so uh, that's one of the, the function. I bought that on Amazon. The splints I bought on Amazon as well. It's a, it's a great resource. They have just about everything that we might need. 
as where as our disease progresses. Sorry, yeah, and uh, I think I basically w went through. Oh, another thing that's helped me because uh, I do have trouble with this with my hands uh, is uh, we bought an alpha bidet for our bathroom for our toilet, and it is. You know how they that Charmin commercial enjoy the go. Well, I'll tell you, you enjoy the go with the bidet because it uh, it works beautifully well. Uh, it 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 really avoids any problems that you might have. And uh, you know we're all adults here. It, it just makes it easier. It makes it easier to to uh, use the the, the facilities. And uh, that's that's one other thing I forgot to mention. But. Uh, our bidet comes next week. We're so I'm so excited. Oh, that's great. That's but great. I got, you know, my daughter the other day was like, I was doing something and she's like, you know, dad, your hands are like Lego hands now. Like, <laughs> like little Lego people have like little C cup hands or whatever. I'm like, yeah, yeah. they kind of are. And I think one, it's great that my my young family, my daughter's 13, my son's 11. So it's it's nice oh. to like we're collectively joking about it like they'll watch me trying to use a bottle opener to open a soda and like you could do it dad <laughs> so that kind of buy-in feels good um at time how about close how about closing the deal with this bidet a heated toilet seat that's awesome. oh try doing yeah. that when it's 20 i got i'll outside. put it in the chat i got what's called the total washlet plus like the most oh. advanced one apparently it go. opens and shuts it like it uh, anticipates that you're going and it sprays itself. So everything like it's like supposed to be, I'll take a video and send it around if you guys want. <laughs> but that's like my birthday present to myself is I'm going to have amazing trips to the bathroom. Um, and it was really funny because like our contractor was over like today, just paint, like we were doing the bathroom and whatnot. He was painting the back of the bathroom door. And they were like commenting on them. Wow, you did a really good job of painting that. And I was like, I'll be admiring that from on top of the toilet every day. <laughs> but yeah. um, but I think that's also really like, there's a couple points, Michael, if I can just kind of tack on to what you were saying. Um, I would say one is I, I, I'm, I was diagnosed at age 44, right? I turned 45 next week. Like I'm still working. I can still work. I've had to work with my company in their accommodations department to get dictation software so that I can dictate emails, which by the way, with AI and machine learning and like today's technology, you can dictate pretty accurately once you learn how. And it even will learn your acronyms, your coworkers' names, it'll scan your emails. So it's pretty damn good. Um, and then I have this little switch effectively that functions as a, I don't know if you could see it here, pardon my shaky hands, but like, it's basically just a little switch here. That's my left mouse click. So I could still move my mouse, but I can't move and click for the life of me. And that right. little switch, as simple as it was, made all the difference between me being able to use my computer. And, you know, I have to give myself breaks during the day and I have to sometimes, you know, work on the weekends or the evenings to catch up what I've missed, you know, work due to clinic visits and other other things but i'm very fortunate my company and my team has been have been wonderful in giving me the time and space to um navigate this illness in the way that i need to and i'm still of course contributing and doing my job so i i know it's very different depending on your i i, I also have remote work uh, my my company ordinarily you're in three days a week and I have a, a medical exception to be remote permanently. And the combination of those things should keep me going for a long time and contributing. And I think that's also really, for me personally, important to my mental health and to just, is that continuity, right? Like my right. career doesn't need to end because of this disease. My, you know, what I do in the morning and how I spend my time. And I think for anybody who, who, you know, you'd be surprised the accommodations that are, I've already been talking to them about eye gaze. Apparently there's three employees in my company who use eye gaze. So you yeah. can, you can there, there's, and I, I mean, now whether you want to or not, but honestly, like for me, working is a big piece of my life and it was, it's still important. 
Right. One thing I would mention, David, uh, I basically the way I type on my computer, I use a number two pencil. Uh, I just turn it over, use the eraser head and hit the keys. That's the only way because my fingers just don't operate properly. And so uh, using a mouse, you know, I have a kind of a large uh, wireless mouse, but I'm having trouble trying to negotiate with my index finger to press it down to click. So it's you know, I have to use the other hand to, you know, I'm using two hands to to utilize the mouse. Mm -hmm. So I like your idea. Yeah, I was, I would say that's to me, the dictation software for the keyboard and the switch for the mouse, like is, is like the total game changer. And right. for anyone in the New York area, there's a great group out of NYU called the Rusk Institute. And they basically imagine this storage closet with all this adaptive technology. Um, and, you know, you can go there and try anything. And she's the one who actually sent me down uh, home with the switch. And I would say, I even put the um, chief health officer of my company in touch with them because I think companies should be working with groups like the, that Rusk Institute to figure out how to keep you know, their employees accommodated and working in a very comfortable way. And I think there's a lot we could still learn to do that. Right. Can I go back on with Michael in the toilet? <laughs> I have what's called a, um, it's actually a toilet lift. That's been a lifesaver for me as well. So wow. basically it's, you know, it's heavy duty. Um, and I just press the button for it to either elevate, you know, which, would lift you know me up so I'm almost at standing position right. and then otherwise it comes you know straight down when I'm using the bathroom uh yeah. so that's really uh beneficial for transitioning that's been that's awesome great that's great you all are great <clears throat> I mean this tonight's program I'm I am so enthused by the information that's been shared tonight I I, I see Gary smiles a lot. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know you, Gary. And uh, yeah, yeah, we folks, we're becoming a really close family and we can say anything we want to each other. We can talk about the toilet all night long. <laughs> all that stuff is more important than uh, many other things. And uh, Elizabeth, you just shake your head up and down and smile. And uh, folks, we have a family and you are part of it. And John Watson, buddy, it's so good to see your, your face. You know, John was up on the NASDAQ bulletin board, five stories high. Uh, we have made a dent in the world with our, um, with our passion to let the world know what's going on, what, what we need, and how can we get it? And so... This has been an exciting, um, informative, and very cozy uh, evening. You've all of the panel um, has made everybody feel like we're in this together. We we can we can pat each other on the back and pat each other on the butt, and we can do we can do we can take care of each other, and that's why we're together. Mm -hmm. So, does anyone else have a comment that they'd like to make? I, I want to say I also take a lot of supplements as well. Um, I do take the the creanine powder, which I feel, you know, they say people bulk up on it, you know, for like athletes, but I do use it to, you know, just to maintain, you know, the muscle mass that I do have. Um, and it's tasteless. It's actually, you know, I have a, like usually a big, um, you know, cup that I drink. It takes me like two days, you know, half and half. But uh, I, I feel like it helps keep my strength. And then, I'll, you know, all the other supplements that I take as well. Is right. Similar to what Michael does. And I, I do also, I forgot to mention this, um, I do get chiropractic care and acupuncture. And right. uh, the lady, has I've been seeing her for years, my doctor, and she's been so kind. Um, you know, I've been living with ALS for two years she has not been charging me for two years. So wow. she's doing it out of the kindness of her heart where, um, you know, I come in and I see her every three weeks and, um, you know, I'm just so full of gratitude just for her doing that for me. And we're proud of her for doing it for you too. Thank you for mentioning that. 
folks, you can always mention who helps you the most. It's a, it's a very positive to let everybody know that there are helpers out there who really care. Michael? I have one question. Uh, as I hope everybody has read uh, McFinn's book because it really is a heart-wrenching story and it's a lot of great details about the ALS reversal. And I, I think it's really good of you to share that information because I know it comes from a very quiet place in your life. Uh, I'm sure you don't like to uh, blare it out to everybody, but to write a book about it is really outstanding. And uh, I really applaud you for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, mindfulness is really what I'm getting involved with right now, because I really think for all of us, we the, there's people that have had reversals, and I'm not trying to do false hopes, but I'm just showing what I think could happen. Uh, I went and did a thing with Robert Worgen, who's a healer. He's a person that's been on, he's he travels the world in what he does, and he's a certified healer out of California. And it was all about getting in into one of the chakra uh, heart chakra type of meditation states. And uh, he just said, you know, you want to feel loved. You want to feel gratefulness and whatever. And uh, at the end of the thing, I was bawling my eyes out. And so I was feeling that it reaches me to a certain extent because I think all these supplements and all these things we're doing, we're trying to get our body into a mode of healing. We try to heal. I do the alkaline water because I think it could heal me. And everything I'm doing, uh, I mean, I, I'm doing a lot of stuff and I don't mean to be so belligerent about saying everything, but I, it, it works for me, at least works for my mind. And it just keeps me in a positive uh, mode so that I can heal. Uh, I tried recently to do a sound healing I went to like for palliative care. Uh, I've thought about chiropractic or, uh, you know, uh, any kind of therapy in that nature. And I really found uh, that the sound healing really settles me. It really gets me to a place where I'm really quiet. And I literally, every time I've gone there, I've fallen asleep because the sound therapy really does seem to resonate in my system. But uh, that's another thing I was doing for mindfulness. Folks, it's one of those times of the day when each of us needs to realize that there's a place to come to. There's people who really care about your situation and you're powerful. You can bring research that medical facility might never even touch because it's your personal experience that really counts. So as we say, we're harnessing the power of citizen research and that's you and that's us and it's what we do together. I want to say one last thing. You're all very special. You all mean the world to us, and we've dedicated our lives to being part of your life. So if there's any way that you have time to help our organization, it'll be not only helping us, but it'll be helping everyone in the world because we share data. And you folks, you're really the bottom line. Um, be proud that you have the power to help someone else with what you've gone through. And with that, one of the most beautiful things that I ever see here is your faces and mm -hmm. your smiles and your wink. Um, and so to each of you and Eric and Jose and Jeff and Doug and Katrina and Kim and Bobby and Diane and John and Chuck and Karen and Elizabeth and John and Lynn and Janie and Michael and David and Eddie, we're, we're, we're more than we uh, seem. So uh, the rest of all of us, Tiffany, Diane and John and Doug, hi Doug, and um, Jeff, so good to see you tonight. 
And Karen, thank you for joining us. Lisa, for your contribution, so well taken. Um, and Gary, thanks for your smile. And Joe, it's good to see you out there, Joe. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, Katrina, you. you got a beautiful background and I love your hairdo. All right, I get a little personal sometimes. Thank you for the smile. Folks, we're gonna call it an evening and uh, we're gonna be back together in seven days if you'd like. So mm -hmm. God bless you and make your uh, sleep time tonight. When you go to sleep, kind of tap on your chest and say, hello in there. We're gonna go to sleep now. Heal me if you can. Thank you, Eric. Okay, folks, on three, let's everybody say good night to everybody. One, two, three, put out those hearts. Good night. Good night, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night everyone. Love to, love to Mona. Next week.